The organisation has been around for about 20 years. Um, I've been involved with it for the last 12, 13 years or so. Um, and like Laura was saying, it's, um, I mean, how many of you guys have been to Bolivia before? Um, uh, one or two? Yeah. So, um, how many have worked on conservation projects, whether in the UK or, or overseas? A few as well, a handful. Um, I mean, it's, it's every project um, has, you know, something very special about it. But, um, but what seemed to be so unique about Interguariasi is that uh, although it's very, very much dedicated towards the care of the animals and, um, and obviously their well-being and the education behind it, um, it's the, the background and the grounding on it isn't really a scientific one. You know, it wasn't set up by ecologists or conservationists or you know, scientists or anything like that. It was very much on humanitarian grounds. It was people that had a very, very close personal connection with the animals there, and um, and that relationship between the humans and the animals is something that um, I think comes out so much more in the organisation. To kind of give you a bit of background on, on how this kind of developed, Intiwariyasi was in the first place actually a children's project. It was it was run by a group of Bolivians um, in the inner cities, in the big cities in Bolivia, in La Paz, Cochabamba, Santa Cruz, some of the large places, and it was working with groups of children, whether it's from wealthy areas or um, you know, sort of, uh, not so nice parts of town, but trying to engage them with the environment. Uh, Bolivia, it's, 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 it's got a lot of challenges. It's one of the poorest countries in South America. And, um, and when the country itself, when it gets told that so often, um, you know, you're the poorest country in your continent, but, you know, it, it does have you know, its effect on self-esteem and on the feeling of the people which live there. And um, I remember when I used to go there at the very start, um, people said, where are you from? And they said, I'm from the UK. Why do you want to come to this dump of a country? So what do you mean? Let's look at what you've got here. And this was the issue with the children which lived in, um, who lived in the cities. You know, it was, it was kind of a common theme that they didn't have much to be proud of, it felt. And so what Intiwariyasi wanted to do was say, look, you should be proud of this country. We've got so much. Look at this environment. Look at all these wonderful natural resources that we've got and we want to protect. But it started off in very basic settings. They worked in a, a very small park in the city. They had half a dozen ducks, um, a couple of spotted monkeys, <laughs> and people would go down, and um, the kids would go down, and they'd work with the animals. They'd do workshops in the area, and um, and they'd start doing marches around the city and the like, um, trying to raise awareness to locals. But it was getting the kids engaged. Um, Unfortunately, after a couple of years, um, politics got in the way and the local mayor decided he wanted to turn that park into a shopping mall. Um, so, um, so they were up to move from on from there. But they wanted to carry on their work. And, you know, there was more momentum with so many of the kids there. Um, and so they went around to look for other areas. It was very much kind of a group of kids and a group of adults with, uh, with these spider monkeys that were travelling on buses and staying in hotels. They had to stay through the back door and things like that. So, I mean, it was a, you know, it's a crazy existence for these people. And, uh, and eventually, um, in time, they managed to find this area of land. It was basically, it was an abandoned state park down in the lowlands, actually in the forest, in the, the kind of the Amazon area, in a place called Mutanari. Um, but they spoke with the local mayor and said, look, what's happening to this land here? It's, well, we don't know what to do with it. And so, well, can we use it? You know, um, can we work with our animals here, have kids here, yeah, yeah, can help yourself. And so this is how it started again, but it was very much, again, focusing on trying to get as many groups of young children down there to be able to engage with the animals and get more of an understanding of the, the wealth of resources they've got in this area. Um, but then word started spreading, and um, it was the only refuge of its kind in South America, or in Bolivia particularly. Um, the, uh, Obviously, the, the cause of conservation was very high on the, the <coughs> government's priorities list at that time. Um, and so, uh, so something like this was quite unique. And um, so whenever there was an animal which was perhaps confiscated at checkpoints when it was being smuggled through, or somebody that had bought a baby puma and had it in a flat in the city and realised that they could actually get quite large, um, I was thinking, what do I do with it? We're just running about this part, so we can take it there. And so it, it kind of grew. Uh, very, very organically. It wasn't their intention, it was to be here for the kids and uh, we want to do this. And then all of a sudden, um, mon more monkeys started turning up, more parrots, and then the first puma turned up. What a big 
are you going to do with this? And it was literally the story behind um, Ghetto, uh, which was the, uh, the first puma which arrived in the park. Um, they learnt about him, basically it was a travelling circus going through the itinerary and word had spread this animal was there and uh, the, uh, a few of the, the local villagers uh, who had kind of engaged with the project as well said, uh, poor puma has been badly treated and they'd spoken to the police and said look, if you want to go and get it then you will do, we'll support you. So God, what the hell can you do with a puma? And this poor thing was, um, its act was to jump through flaming hoops like I'm sure often happened in, uh, in circuses back in the day. But to, um, <coughs> To, uh, to get him to jump through the hoops, they whip his hind legs, and so his hind legs were lame, and it was a horrible, horrible story. And they went in, they thought, well, we've got to do something about it. I'm not sure what, but um, so they went in and um, they said, look, we've got to confiscate this animal if you, you're not treating it well. Um, and there were these big arguments between the local police and, um, and, the, uh, and the circus owners. And while all this was going on, one of the, the heads of the organisation, Nitty Wariassi, kind of walked into the cage well, I've got to do something here. Thought, what the hell's going to happen? And, um, and as he walked in, um, the puma didn't move. And um, he thought, well, what's, what's wrong? Is he, is he scared? Is there something? And then he realised that his, his hind legs were so lame that he was hardly able to move at all. So that all of a sudden, at that point, he actually went down and just picked him up. It was a fully grown puma, I think 100 kilos or something. Yeah, they're pretty large. And, um, and both the circus owners who'd never tried to do that and the police were just so shocked they would just sit there in silence and he just walked past them <laughs> and they came into the park and, and that was the first people that came in now they've got about 30 different felines which they're working with and, um, but you know, it's, it's all been grown on this, uh, this real genuine love and you know, desire to, to care for these animals um, you know, this animal if you went to a, a conservation project or a zoo or something because it was lame Perhaps the scientific approach to it would say, well, this animal needs to be put down. But um, the argument is, you know, just like a human gets nursed back to health when it's not well, so should any wild animal. And so, um, you know, this was very much the, theory, the, the belief and the philosophy and the basis of all of it. And so as time has gone on, their scientific and their veterinary knowledge and their animal behaviour has grown immensely. I mean, their experience is so much better. But, but the basis and the, the feeling for that is still very much based on, you know, this guy who walks into a cage and picks up a humor in his arms, not having a clue what was going to go on with it. <laughs>